Hey everybody, uh, Glenn Gower here. If you're interested in the spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, angels versus demons, how do humans fit into all this? Can we get possessed? Things like that. You've come to the right place. We're going to talk about all that and more. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome to the Glenn Gower Podcast, the best podcast you'll listen to all day. <laughs> Sponsored by... Mission Blueprint. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Welcome, Dennis, back to the show. How you doing, buddy? I'm great. Thanks we got for a, having me again. Yeah, we got a guest, Pastor Matt, our good buddy from Brookings, South Dakota, is here. And uh, you want to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm Pastor Matt Worm. I've uh, been a pastor for 15 years now. I was up in Bemidji, Minnesota at Trinity Lutheran there for five years. And now I've been at Mount Calvary in Brookings for a little bit over 10 and, um, uh, you know, Dennis invited me and then Glenn as well onto this podcast, because over my years, both in ministry and then prior to ministry, I've, I've had some experiences, um, uh, none that I wanted to bring upon myself, that, that's for sure, uh, with the darkness and the, and the works of the evil one. And uh, I try not to, to talk about it too much, um, but only to do so in order to mock the devil, in order to shame him, in order to laugh in his, his face. And uh, um, so Luther, I'm Lutheran, right? Uh, so Luther has uh, written a fair bit about the devil, and he and his aim and his application of his theology is, um, is to stand in confidence in Christ over the, uh, the works of the devil and, um, and how uh, at the name of Christ, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth must bow down. And so uh, what we're trained to do is that any time you feel you sense some sort of spiritual oppression, the works of darkness, the evil one, something like that. You call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. It's a common refrain, right, that we have in our, in our litany all, all the time. Um, but then also to, to laudably speak the name of Christ, uh, Christ Jesus, the name of Jesus, that every in heaven and earth on earth, um, to, to make them scatter and, and flee. Uh, you know, like um, like cockroaches on the floor as you're trying to stomp on them, and, and so our um, just kind of in general, our our work as Christians is is to remind the devil that he's lost, and uh, in a way to mock him. You know, I'm not a big guy for encouraging my teenagers to. Uh, uh, you know, trash talk out on the court or out in the field or something like Larry that. Bird. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Larry, <laughs> that guy was amazing in so many respects. So, uh, but on, the, on the spiritual battlefield, I do. And, and it is right. And it is proper to mock the evil one, uh, because he's the evil one and he's, he's lost. He, he's been beaten down by the death of Christ. And uh, in his descent into hell, which is a victory march, that's what we uh, we believe, and uh, uh, and that's okay, and that's actually a, a good thing, yep. Yeah. But in the meantime, beware, because the devil's power is real, and he doesn't like to lose. You know, that's really true. A lot of Christians don't realize um, that Satan is really alive. I think the lie, the great lie he's told us in the West, right, is that I'm not real. And so uh, we succumb to fear, which I think is one of his big tactics, don't you think? Yeah. Um, I, I forget who it was. Um, I'm forgetting at the top of my head, but said um, uh, the, um, one of the, the, the biggest demon in the West is complacency. Uh, complacency that gets us to ignore the reality of evil and in the devil. And every once in a while you have evil kind of rear its ugly head again, like, you know, years ago with 20, uh, uh, the, uh, 2001 with the Twin Towers coming down. Right. You know, you, you just saw thousands of people die before your eyes as they came down. And who is the author of death and destruction, Dennis? Who, who is the author of this? The Lucifer. That's exactly right. And this is what we're dealing with, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, as we get into the show today... Uh, I've asked Pastor Matt, give us just a brief theology of angels, because I think there's a lot of Americans, a lot of Catholics and other Christians that don't really believe angels exist. Oh, and I've it, seen them. Yeah, I, but I think you and I had, not a debate, but you you weren't really sure at one time, right, of angels right, in your life? Right. That, well, I was thinking the Victoria's Secret angels. I mean, I'm not sure what Matt's going to speak to, but... <laughs> You know, what kind of podcast did you invite me on here? <laughs> uh, this is kind of rated R sometimes. Uh, well, no, we did have that way. discussion because my son has talked numerous times about seeing them or catching the glimpse out of the corner of his eye, and we did have that discussion on a previous podcast 
about are they real? Are they not? Are they with us? Are yeah. we not? So I look forward to hearing Matt's perspective on this theology of who and where they are. So let's hear some theology about angels. So, you know, we, we got to keep our theology straight, that our, 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 um, our understanding of God doesn't originate from our experiences. And it's kind of, you know, people have seen angels, had spiritual experiences, maybe with demons. Um, that's very formative for them. And I can't say to somebody, nope, that wasn't an angel. Nope, that wasn't a demon, because I wasn't there. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't judge. I can't tell somebody they didn't have that experience. So we got to guard ourselves not to let our experiences form our understanding of who God is, but we let his word uh, form us. And, and give light to our experiences so we can see clearly what is of God and what is not of God. And the devil always wants us to, to uh, you know, not see clearly uh, and to, to cloud that line of good and, and evil so that he might catch us in some sort of evil. So, you know, going back to Scripture, um, just a few weeks ago we celebrated uh, at our church St. Michael and All Angels, which falls every year on September the 29th. Uh, but we've decided to just celebrated every sun uh, every year whatever it is we're going to move it you know earlier in september later in uh, or uh, you know a little bit later in september or, is or it just the last october. sunday of september yeah that's typically what we'll do or the first sunday in october so we celebrate on october 1st so saint michael and all angels uh, has a reading from daniel uh, which is eschatological looking forward to to the end um, and then it's a gos- and then an epistle reading uh, from uh, from revelation chapter 12 where uh, numerous times there's this Greek word katabalo, which is uh, thrown down, thrown down, thrown, I think seven times, if not more than that. Y- you get this refrain that the devil is thrown down, his angels and all of his, his, uh, his demons with him fall down, they're thrown down, they're cast down. And I have this image in my head, you know, I, I was raised back in the day with WWF before it became Ooh. WCW, right? Yeah. You know, Jake and the uh, uh, yeah, Jake the Snake, Breck the Hitman Heart. Uh, Hulk Hogan, of course. Uh, my favorite guys were the Bushwhackers. They were, I remember the Bushwhackers. They, were, they, were they were gross. <laughs> um, Andre the Giant, of course, as well. Uh, you had Rashiki. Uh, you could keep going on all these different guys. Man, I had no idea. I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I watch great. wrestling all the time. It, it was totally not real. Right. Yeah. Um, but but the best was when they're up on the ropes, right? And they, you know, and they just throw them down. And they hit the mat, bam. And, you know, some of them even gone went through the mat, you know, on the, in the cage matches or, or whatever, and the big pay-per-views. But but that's what I think of in this 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 great war. And the gospel lesson for St. Michael is uh, when Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You know, bam, crash. This huge, fast, you know, powerful... Um, act of God that that tosses uh, the Lord's opponent out of his throne room, out of his place. And he comes crashing down to the earth with big thunder, you know, big crash. And um, in, the, in the reading from Revelation 12, it says that this one who's been cast out of heaven, the evil one, uh, has been thrown down repeatedly. Now he's, he's turned loose um, to, to go after the offspring of Eve, uh, the offspring of, of man. And so he, he's turned loose, two part, to go against Christ as Christ was tempted, you know, certainly in the wilderness and throughout his ministry in the garden before he goes to the cross and uh, the offspring of Eve, which is us as well. So the devil tempts us. Um, so the, and the way it works is you had uh, three legions or three uh, commanders of the angels in heaven. You had uh, Lucifer, you had Saint Michael, uh, and then you had Raph, Raphael, right? I think it was Raphael or Gabriel. Or Ga- Ga- the, Gabriel. So we yeah. would say those are uh, archangels. Yeah, 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 the archangels. And so then, then Lucifer, an angel of light, because that's what his name means, uh, Luce, uh, Lucifer. Um, he goes against some for whatever reason uh, against against the other good angels, against Gabriel, um, against Saint Michael. War breaks out in heaven, and uh, the angels cast him out, and then he, he's thrown down. So, you know, when I teach about angels, uh, like my aunt, for instance, she used to have all these little um, cherub things or what what are they called? Precious moments, right? You have little precious moments that everybody had kind of back in the day. And in in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, something like that, there's a lot of like angelology 
where people would get into the angels and they would ponder these things that aren't necessarily clear in Holy Scripture, but they read books about people that had experiences. Then angels saved them, they saw a light, or a bad angel was after them, and uh, you know, they, they put a book out. And well, that's back in the day when they had Stairway to Heaven and all the TV shows about angels, they too. They did? Oh, yeah. Touched by an angel? Yeah, Touched yes, by an exactly, angel. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was a... It was a cultural thing, yeah. and, you know. Thankfully, that's kind of gone away. But but people, I think, started to worship angels a little bit, you know, um, more than than the creator of the angels. So you don't you never want to worship the created. You want to worship right. the creator. Or sometimes people would say their parents died or their brother died, and they would say no, they're now angels, you know, in heaven. And it's like no. yeah, because was it miracle on Forty uh, First Street? 40 Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Yeah. And no, that's no, no, no. That's uh, a, a few, a few, a few good men. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a wonderful life, right? It's Gina? a wonderful life. That was yeah. it. Yeah, it's a wonderful. Life. There it is. Uh, you know, and a few that good men. It's not the time when someone says, "Oh, your your little three year old that died is now an angel in in heaven," and it's not the time to correct them on their theology right then and there. <laughs> yeah, knock so it off, you, woman. Have uh, you tried that? Uh, no, oh, okay, I haven't. Uh, you got to do it beforehand and and afterwards too. But actually, um, so getting back to this, so when I teach about angels, I say, "Do you believe in angels?" And everybody says, "Oh yeah, 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 I believe in angels. I love my angels. Um, I got my little you know angel cherub thing at, at home from Precious Moments, and uh, and you know my aunt had a a, a baby that died would have been my niece, and it, you know I know I'm, I know it's an angel now in heaven. I'm like, you know, it's not exactly true, but okay. So you believe in angels? Great. God created angels. Do you believe that demons are real? Oh, no, no. I don't believe demons are real. Demons are fake. That's just all the Halloween stuff, you know, and the stuff you see on, uh, you know, computer-generated mu- movies and what. I'm like, well, actually, no. They're the same created order. A created order of being. You can't say you're a Christian, believe in God's words, and only believe in good angels and not bad angels, right? Uh, and, and along with that, too, is, is angels have power. So in, in the created order of things, we as humans... Um, have power. Our power is actually in prayer. Uh, that's that's what God has given to us. Um, in the Word of God and prayer is how we take up the sword of the Spirit. Uh, but the angels have power too. Uh, they guard over us and they're messengers. They're messengers of God. Uh, so the, the the evil angels, you don't mess with because they got power. You know, when you, you, you pray that the holy angels would guard over you, you have a guardian angel, and, and you believe in, that the Lord will send them as these ministering spirits to guard over you, and they'll, they'll protect you in all of your ways. So th- you can't, I guess getting back to that point, say that you believe in good angels and not bad angels. Right. You, you can't say that only good angels have power and bad angels don't have power. Uh, in all of that, uh, I kind of wrap up my teaching in saying, stay away from the bad angels. Stay away from demons. Anything that looks or smells or sniffs, Anything like the evil one, you just run away from it. You get away because his power is real. And think, the devil's angel's power is real. I think what's happened is um, uh, some of the movies that we watch have created a paradigm shift in the way we think of bad angels. Um, sometimes in some of the movies... I think they're normalizing some, it. Well, that too, but they're, they're making it like these, these bad people are humorous or funny. And angels can be friendly like Casper the Friendly Ghost. And I was working with a young person in a small town in this area, 15-year-old, and he said to me, um, yeah, I see, I see my guardian angel. And I said, well, how do you know he's a guardian angel? Because he's, he told me. And I said, uh, well, what do you guys talk about? Oh, he just needs a friend. That's what he said to me. I said, what do you mean? My guardian angel, he just needs a friend. He's lonely. And so I asked the question again, how do you know that's your guardian angel? Well, he said so. So then we got a priest involved, and we met with him. And uh, during our meeting, uh, I, I don't know if I was the only one who heard this, but another friend of mine from Arlington was in that meeting, and we heard these screeching noises in the room, right? But uh, I don't know that the kid did or not, and I know the priest did as well. Hmm. And uh, the priest said, well, we can pray with you, but you got to give us permission to, to stop talking to this angel. And he said, no, I won't. He said, you mean you won't give us permission? No, well, we can't really help you. We can pray with you, but if you refuse to stop talking, then we can't really do anything. Well, this kid and his family fell away and stopped going to church altogether. 
and I don't know, I haven't checked on them recently, but so then you, you just think of the fruit, right? Jesus says, um, you judge a tree by its fruit. And then this short, this one ex- example, uh, this kid saw his friend that's a ghost or an angel and he fell away from Christianity. So what happened there? Not an angel of God, right? Um, the, the messengers, all the messengers of God point us to Christ. If there's any messenger, spiritual messenger, that points you other anywhere other than to Christ, that is not of God. Yeah, there's this couple in this small town or close to us. <laughs> I don't want to say where it is, but they said, oh, yeah, we our angel, he's he appears to us all the time. He said this to the priest in town. Well, what do you mean? Well, he gets under our bed and he pushes up all the time on our bed and he wakes us up at night. And But he's a friendly one. Are you joking? Wow. I am not joking. You're not joking? No. No, we have some really crazy stories from the Xbox and the marching things out of that to the patient I oh, had yeah. that came into my clinic oh, yeah. and yep. that... Tell that story quick. Okay, so we had a patient, came in, um, a absolute mess, uh, moving like a snake, like just almost like a convulsion. From a medical standpoint, would have thought she was having some sort of seizure. She came in, and she goes, I'm under spiritual attack. She, she goes, I've decided to convert from atheism to Christianity. She had pentagrams tattooed up her arm and other markings on her body. Just, she said, years and years ago, she had given herself to the dark and evil one. Well, she grew up in uh, a coven, didn't she? Yep, more or less. And yes, a Wiccan coven, yes. Mm-hmm. And she was coming out of it. She had gone up to Oakwood because she couldn't find a local priest or pastor that would baptize her. So they did a family baptism where they just all dunked each other at Oakwood. And after that, she was a mess, and she talked to me quite extensively about her four turtles that Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, um, and Raphael is what she called them, but they were four demons that she conversed with on a very regular basis, but she just called them her four turtles, and they were always with her, and now that she was pulling back, she was just under this incredibly intense attack and i had called you because we we did kind of i think you call it a binding prayer so over dennis her. so ladies and gentlemen dennis called me when he had her in the office and he didn't really know what to do and one of the things he did is grab the holy water right yeah i keep a bottle of holy water in the clinic yeah and then uh one of the things that happened when you're in the room with her that the room got really really hot got really hot and you said you're sweating yeah producing. is she and i brought the bottle of water in and she's like i don't want that here so what happened then is he got me on the phone and explained to me about this, what was going on with this young lady. And, and I was sicker than a dog, man. You were. I was sick. And, and so I said, well, uh, I prayed a little bit. I said, I think we should just do a binding prayer. And then I'm willing to meet with this young lady. And so I prayed a binding prayer, which just means you, you bind the evil one. And I think what, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you don't, a lot of Christians don't understand is there's so much power through our baptism in the name of Christ. Mm-hmm. We have so much power, but um, we're too... We either don't know or we're too afraid to use it. Well, like so Matt that, said, the power God gave us is through prayer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then what happened when I prayed the binding prayer? I sweat. I, I, <laughs> I sweat through my shirt. That was crazy. But then she got just peaceful. She just, everything went calm. Kind of like a storm passing. So what really happened then is it's kind of like you put chains like you handcuff the demons, so they can't really do much to harm, you know, this young lady or you or anyone if you bind them. But you need someone to get the demons out. And I know she actually did go and see someone. I don't know if it was a Catholic priest or a Protestant I'm pastor. I'm not but sure which one, but I'm yeah, sh- I, I she's heard- still counseling and and getting spiritual direction. Okay, so I, we need to check in with her and see how she's doing. But ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is real. This is not. Uh, this is not some make-believe old folklore. This is legitimate stuff that we're talking about here. Well, I think this ties perfectly into understanding where angels come from and the theology behind them to what is it that I experienced in my clinic and what is what are these patrons of, of Matt's church and uh, you've been through is the spiritual warfare, the warfare that's happening. And is that real? Yeah, do you want to... Talk a little bit about spiritual warfare with us. Yeah, um, actually, in my uh, 
BibleGateway.com, I got Ephesians 6 pulled up right here, which is the full armor of God. So right before that, we put on the full armor of God. Uh, St. Paul says this, uh, chapter 6, verse 10 of Ephesians, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, not our own, his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that may be able to take your stand. And, you know, it goes on. Um, so a, a number of things from what St. Paul says here. Number one is we don't wrestle ag against you know, the person who's in front of you. And there's more than just, uh, you know, angels and demons to take out of this, is when, when you're really mad at somebody who sinned against you greatly or who has deceived you greatly, and oftentimes it's someone who's really close to you, you know, like a spouse or a kid, right? And you just no way! Right? Oh, I was a family member, right? And, and, you, and you, or, or a co-worker, so right? And you just, you want to get against them and you want to make them feel the way that you did or do what they did to you. Hurt them. Even worse than they hurt you. Your battle is not against that person that you love, but your battle is against the devil, right? So the, the devil's got a hold of them. The devil's come into that situation because he's been scheming against you. He's trying to pull you away from Christ. If Christ were there, Christ would speak truth. He would forgive. It'd be the law and the gospel in there as well. Um, uh, but, but getting back to the, the, the schemes of the devil, uh, there is a book written uh, probably 30 years ago now by uh, Frank Peretti called This Present Darkness. And it's um, you know, a fictional uh, sort of book. But I think that book was helpful in that it brought attention to the realities uh, of the angels fighting for us, the good angels, um, against, against the evil angels. Uh, I, I, could, I don't know how many different stories I, I, I could tell right here, but uh, kind of one of the more recent ones is... I get a lot of advice from pastors who work with Native American people. And, and, and at least in our circles, all of them say uh, resoundingly is that for some reason or another, the devil has got a really tight grip on, on the Native American spirituality. And, uh, and I think that is in a number of reasons. One is they can confess, so we're thinking about the creed here, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They can confess, well, I believe in a creator God. They can confess, well, I believe in a spirit God, you know, exemplified by you know, the spirits and uh, the eagle and so forth. But they, but they misstep on Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, and they have such a hard time confessing Christ and confessing Christ Jesus alone. Uh, you take that over and kind of step back a little bit, uh, you know, to other spiritualities here in the United States that fall into the same sort of sort of trap. Um, you can look at uh, uh, Joseph Smith and the heresy of the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, Joseph Smith saw an angel. Uh, the angel Moroni came to him and gave him uh, the Book of, of Mormon. It just came down from, from heaven. Well, you know, maybe that wasn't an angel of God, right? And, uh, and so... Uh, the, the Mormons can confess faith in a creator God and a spirit, the Holy Spirit, but they deny the, the deity that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father from all eternity. Take it out a little bit further. What other kind of spirituality is similar to that? Well, Islam. Bingo. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, so Mo Muhammad is hanging out, and he hears this voice. So it's the angel Gabriel that comes to him numerous times, and he gives him this New Testament, uh, you know, the book of... Of the Quran, and uh, and so likewise with him, we'll confess the, the God of Abraham who created the world, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, as well in his continued work, but not in the divinity of of, of Christ. Uh, getting back to Native American spirituality, I want to talk about the power of baptism for a little bit. Okay, so back when I was in seminary, uh, we had. Uh, a, a number of Madagasy, so Madagascar, Madagasy Lutheran pastors who came to the seminary we have in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they were there doing theological work, uh, getting trained to go back. Now, by the way, the Lutheran Church in Madagascar is like 7 million members. It's wow. Yeah, yeah. It's just in incredibly huge. Um, in Madagascar, they were planting uh, 12 churches a month. Wow. For, for years, yeah. And uh, so we had a fireside chat with these guys. There was about, I don't know, half a dozen or eight of these Madagasy Lutheran pastors. And we were all kind of curious about uh, the, the spiritual atmosphere in there. 
in Madagascar. And they said every year th- they have uh, a service, but it like lasts an entire weekend of exorcism. It's the only Lutheran church that I know of that regularly performs exorcisms. And they said they do it because of this, that the voodoo and animism, so it's the worship of the created, worship of animals, worship of trees, worship of whatever the spirit has personified itself. Um, and so you give yourself in liturgical rites uh, with materials, uh, you know, different elements of, of wood, of stone, of ropes, uh, whatever it might be, of precious metals um, included in that. And so you, you, you bind yourself to this evil spirit, which doesn't want to give up right away. Right. So you're speaking about binding prayers. So in the liturgical rites of voodoo, of animism, of uh, I would even go so far to say as, well, certainly in, in, in Mormonism um, and in Native American spirituality, there's liturgical rites too. Uh, the, the devil doesn't let go he's so easily, you know, because he's got you and he, he, you, you let him in, you know, not just on the surface, but really deep in. Your into mind. Your, into your soul, right? Um, and, and so they, they repeatedly do these exorcisms, and, uh, and the church just, just is uh, growing fantastically. So we asked them, these pastors, like, well, is there a difference between demonic oppression and demonic possession? And they said, yeah, there is. And, uh, and they said this, is that uh, the demon cannot possess a baptized child of God unless that baptized child of God throws off his or her baptism. Now, you can reject your baptism. There's a blasphemy challenge about 10 or 15 years ago on the Internet. It was just entirely of the devil. Um, you know, you, you can throw off God's promises to you, unfortunately. But, but that, what that does is let the devil in, and so you give control. You bind yourself not to Christ, but you bind yourself to the devil. So then you can be possessed. But for a lot of Christians, we, we face oppression, which is like, uh, I think, akin to the, the Lord's temptation in the wilderness or in the Garden of Eden, uh, where the, the oppression of the evil one comes upon us, maybe in different forms, uh, maybe through uh, mental illness, uh, through despair, um, through uh, physical maladies and means around you, whatever, or just a kind of a darkness and a clouding of, of one's mind and, and heart. And so their advice was this, is anytime you feel the devil's oppression against you, you laudably speak the name of Christ. You say, I am a baptized child of Christ. Satan, you cannot have me. And you just repeat that. And so you, you, you mock the devil, you remind him that he's got no power over you, and it's linked to your baptism, your baptism to Christ, where he has bound himself to you, and the devil can't have you. And that's one of the sacraments that's under attack. Mm, it, yeah. Isn't it? it? It just befuddles me. So, you know, I'm Lutheran, Roman Catholic. We have a pretty similar view on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like the places where the Lord attaches his, his promise most surely uh, is in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. And you see like where churches are divided against each other in the Christian churches. Well, I got a different view on the Lord's Supper. I got a different view on baptism. Um, you know, I'm Reformed and I'm right on the Lord's Supper, or I'm Baptist and I'm right on, on, on baptism. Like, well, uh, how about let's not get be divided about this and just let Christ's word stand and, uh, and Amen. put the devil out of the room. Yeah, that's a, that's a piece that we should talk about sometime. Dennis and I have gone... <laughs> Not round and round, but there's some differences in, in our belief, and there's a lot of Christians who allow their, their kids to choose for themselves, but I think that's just a philosophical faux pas. The child never chose to be born in the first place. The parents, with God's help, uh, created that child, and if we can choose to have a baby, we can choose um, salvation, but in the end, it's up to the child to, some would call it a dedication it's confirmation in my movement. I, I, I suspect you call it confirmation as well, or I don't know, actually. Do you have confirmation? So we celebrate a sacrament of confirmation where yeah. the individual comes forward and says, Catholics don't think about it this way, but you should, Catholics, that I want to be Jesus' disciple and I need the Holy Spirit to do his work. That's ultimately what, in the Catholic realm, and I think in the Protestant realm, we say we have semantic issues, but... That's really what we're trying to do is give our complete lives to Christ and come Holy Spirit to do God's work. And I came from the Lutheran fold. And I can tell you, like, we did the baby baptisms, dedications. You know, we did religious education. And then Wednesday nights we did our confirmation class. And I can tell you that 
the confirmation class was never taught. See, what what I realize now as a forty some year old man with children that our confirmation class was not taught with any seriousness or reverence. It was scripture to memorize. It wasn't anything that made me think about where am I going and who am I going to be in this world. It was just checking a box, showing up each week, and it was so vanilla that it gave me no passion going out into the world of being a warrior for Christ. Not like I have now. And I wish on wishes of fishes that that reverence and that importance would have been transferred in the classroom as a teenager, the, the brimstone and fire of this is serious. Um, but I also will attribute that that's probably part of my upbringing too, is that I, I didn't have a strong father figure that made me a warrior of Christ. Yeah. And not to blame your dad, because no. I think probably my dad uh, and a lot of dads, we just did it the same way. We right. went to, we went to our church service Sunday morning and we obeyed God's Ten Commandments, and we tried to be a, whatever it means, a good Christian, right? We tried to do it, but, and I think that's part of another whole attack in Christ's church. But I think our spiritual warfare has intensified over the last 30 years. Yeah, and, and I would say, kind of, we shifted off to baptism confirmation here, but kind of bringing us back here, I think, to our, our, our topic. Yeah. Um, so the devil works underneath the cloak of darkness to distract us all the time, you know, to pull us away, to cloud, uh, to cloud the truth of God. And um, I, I, I should have looked up who this guy was, but it was a quote on complacency, like the like the biggest demon of uh, the West is complacency. And before we went on the air here, we we're just talking about pastoral ministry and you know mm-hmm. and the difference between Roman Catholic and, and our, our flavor Missouri Synod of, of Lutheran, and you know complacency gets at all of us, especially oh, yes. laziness, especially for men, you know, and it, it, it's refreshing when you meet some other guys that that uh, drive you right. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, encourage you not just yell and scream at you and belittle you, uh, but encourage you to be the men that God desires of you to be, right? And so you lead by example. Um, which in the Christian church is humility. You know, it, it's the it's a, a putting to death of pride uh, and, and arrogance, which is the exact opposite of like, you know, our major sports figures these, these days, right? So it's, uh, we're, we're definitely countercultural. But our church body, you know, Dennis, absolutely. I, I pull out my hair every year with these eighth graders because they just kind of keep getting younger and younger. They're not the same eighth graders, you know, that they were a hundred years ago in terms of life experience. They haven't had anything hard. No. So we, you have kind of at the same time, you got to teach these truths of God, uh, but unless you you have the experience, you know, to to understand to pair with these truths of God, they don't land home and rest in the same way in in one's mind and and thoughts. But you can't, you know. Uh, throw a, a young child out to the wolves and just you know cast him into the the, the hedonism the the full acts of evil of the world, you know you you have to uh, you know balance it. So uh, at our church we try to give them a measured amount of of encouragement to be good ordered young men and young women. But, but if you've it's never been through hard or you've never been through something evil, it's hard to have a frame of reference of what the heck are you talking about? Yeah. And I think the devil actually helps us with this. Uh, uh, we, we say that um, the devil is the Lord's devil. You know, that he's, um, uh, Luther says that uh, the devil is God's devil. He's like a, a dog, but he's on a choke chain. He's on a leash. He only lets him go so far. And when you think of it that way, kind of stepping back theologically, that um, there's a lot of evil, there's a lot of death, the war in Israel right now. Uh, uh, you, you think about people in your own community or your own family have had cancer or struggles with marriage or, uh, or or whatever it might be with their, you know, with their children, and you think, oh, this is so terrible. Why did God give give us this? Why did God give that child, that young mother, cancer, and now now they've died? Why did why did this? Happen? Why did my dad lose his job? This is um, so in one respect, you can step back and say, well, you know, evil had a part in there, right? Because you know, dad lost his temper or whatever it was, or marriage uh, was dissolved or, um, you know, divorced because adultery happened. Um, but, but the Lord still uses that evil 
the works of the devil for his good and for his purpose. As Romans 8, 28, that God works all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. And so I think we, we can even stand in confidence when evil on the devil's account does befall us or other people and say, ha, the Lord is still using this for my good. I don't like it right now, but I know he's a good Lord and he's a good God because he's given me Jesus and he's taken my sins away. And his word is true that he's going to be with me even in the midst of this. Jesus didn't get to avoid the devil. Jesus didn't get to avoid hardship, betrayal. Jesus didn't get to avoid death. I'm crucified with Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection, his new life to come. And so you can have, you know, just stand in confidence with Christ, uh, which is in your baptism over the devil. But how many people own that like you do? Like how many of your parishioners, how many people that we interact with get it? Like really, yeah. really You want a get stat? It? Uh, not many, right? I'd, that's what I'd, I'd say up to 2%. In in the Catholic world, uh, they did a stat of um, what percentage of Catholics are living the gospel every day. Yeah, it was about between one and two percent. Isn't that sad? I, I, and I think a lot of it is just the ease that we have in the West. You know, the blinders that we've put on um, to the evil one, which, by the way, I think are coming off. Uh, yep. when, when you don't acknowledge the devil's presence, he's not going to be there. When you do acknowledge his presence, he's going to show up. These, these uh, Native American missionaries taught, uh, told me that. They said, um, Matt, if you're ever working with somebody that is coming out of that spirituality, but they, they still do smudging and they still have, have dream catchers, these are liturgical, religious, right? I mean, you do incense, right? Let the incense of mm-hmm. repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord. And so smudging is, uh, is incense not to the Father, but to the evil one. I've never heard of smudging. What? Yeah. No, what is of, smudging? Do you know what smudging? I've never no. heard of it. Really? No, tell us. Well, I don't want to, don't do it. Um, <laughs> what is it? Well, don't you, do you, what? You I don't even know you what get, it is. You get sage, like sage brush, sage, yeah. whatever, oh. and you light it on fire and then you, you smoke it. Do the smoke. You do the smoke. That's a smudging in the different rooms and in the different places. And, and so, uh, Native American spirituality is when you feel something bad in that room, something ain't good. Or, you know, in this place or this time in your life, then then you smudge. But it's it's a in essence a prayer to your your forefathers, a prayer to the spirits to defend you from the bad spirits. But in actuality, what it is it is just inviting the spirits back to to come back um, and and deceive you. And as you give yourself in these liturgical rites mm-hmm. more towards the evil one. And uh, a missionary friend of mine who's who's worked out at. Um, uh, Pine Ridge for his, his father for fifty years, I think, between he and his father. Um, he said it's he's like living uh, leaving out scraps for a, a a rabid dog. You know, when you leave out food for the dog, the dog's gonna come back for the stray dog. So you just don't do it. You you shut it down. Wow. Um, and I think it, that's important. Uh, you just don't do it. One of the Catholic adages or Christian adages is if you play with fire. You're going to get burned. Uh, there were some college students up at Northern State University at the Newman Center who thought it was a good idea to convert Satan. And guess what time of day they did this? About two in the morning. <laughs> now, first of all, where did the idea come from, right? Where did Convert it, Satan? Yeah. They, these college so, students? Yes. Convert uh, Satan? They, they had, had, had these conversions. Well, that's dumb. And they were, yes, of course. It's, and they were coming into Christ. And someone had this idea to convert Satan. So they thought they would be the ones they were called by God. And guess what happened? Satan showed up. Now he didn't appear to them, but he scared the hell out of them. And they were pounding at the chaplain's door at two or three in the morning. He's like, what is the matter with you? What's going on? We got spooked out because uh, something actually happened to them. Now I don't know the whole story. Yeah. I don't want to know. It's like calling the four corners, <laughs> but and they, they show up. But ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to play with fire here. You want to stay oh. away from them, right? And I think that's a really important point that we need to make. Stay, stay away. Yeah, Ouija boards, the uh, sorcery, you know, um, uh, fortune telling, any of that. So paganism is really on its on the rise right now. It's just uh, Gnosticism of the ancient world rehashed. That's it fits. That's what it, it is. It fits in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy. Yep. 
uh, but you know the the pagan paganism, druids, druidism, uh, druids, uh, new age, all of that is kind of morphing in different ways. The devil is the master of remarketing, and so he just takes his heresies and his uh, his lies that worked in the past, and then he makes them fit for the present. Rebrands them. Yeah, he's he's a great rebrander. Mm-hmm. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. Next week is part two, where we discuss Ouija boards, Acts 19, Satanic music, the Sons of Cain. What does it mean to cover yourself with the precious blood and some experiences we have had with the Satanic Church? Finally, a story by Father Michael Scanlon that you're not going to want to miss. See you next week.